ideas. And so that's, that is kind of the, the basic tension that we're seeing. That's what's generating uh, that tension is we're seeing in conflict with these basic assumptions um, or shaping how we shape our worldview. In looking at this as a social movement, there are a number of institutions in our society that shape our worldview, and, and we see a lot of activity in the Christian right on affecting those institutions or creating alternatives to those institutions. And one is the media. I mean, the obvious one that, that shapes how we all view the world is the information we're presented and how we receive that through the media. And within the Christian right, what we've seen is a tremendous amount of effort to influence and to develop um, their own media. Uh, Christian radio stations all, all over the place, all around the country, um, Christian bookstores, uh, the televangelists, syndicated radio programs, syndicated television programs. There is a lot of emphasis on, on working with the media in an effort to begin to shape a worldview that is somewhat different than the, the kind of secular worldview um, that they feel the rest of our society has. Uh, and so that's, that's one community institution that they've devoted an awful lot of energy to. Um, and by and large, that energy has been dedicated to creating alternatives, and it's come in a lot of different ways. Um, the second that, that we're seeing an increasing amount of activity in is the judiciary. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, but philosophically, it's the judiciary that begins to interpret things like, uh, what does the free exercise of religion as guaranteed in the Constitution really mean? Um, what are free speech rights? It's the judiciary that takes kind of the cloth of the, the statutes and our legal documents that, that govern this country and um, interprets that into what it really means when it's on the ground operating. Um, and the other thing that's happened is that the judiciary has changed in nature dramatically through the Reagan and Bush years. The, the appointments to the federal bench have created a... Um, an environment where activists within the Christian right feel that they can make some headway. They also attribute many of um, the problems and much of the shift that they see as our country going from a Christian nation to this kind of secular nation, and they attribute that to the activity of the judiciary. And so that's another area where we're seeing a lot of increased activity. Part of it is because it, it really is an institution in society that shapes, um, shapes how we behave but also it's become a much more friendly forum over the last 12 years. And so we're seeing now, um, Pat Robertson has a law school, um, we're seeing um, institutions being set up within the Christian right that are dedicated to litigation and, and moving through the court systems to, to get some of the social changes that they'd like to see. Then obviously, uh, the education system, and now we'll start getting what the sign outside the door said. The education system does a lot to, to shape the views that um, we all have of what our society is, what our role in society is, and, and what we learn, and shaping our world through the education system is obviously a major um, player. I guess there's, it's interesting to me, I'm not an educator by training, um, but recently I went to a conference in Denver, Colorado that was really for educators about the religious right and responding democratically to, to the religious right. It was sponsored by uh, um, an educational consulting group that's done a lot of the work on school reform. And there were about 350 people there from all over the country, um, a lot of different, different speakers. And what was interesting to me, having worked on this issue from the perspective of a, a community group or an, a private nonprofit organization trying to be organized and counter some of the ideas um, that we see coming out of the Christian right, was there were two very distinct camps um, at this meeting. And one was educators and all of the people that were educated. And one was educators who felt that they were in the middle between competing interests, that their job as a community institution was to strike some kind of balance between the extreme right and the extreme left. Um, and that the difficulty here was the pressure being brought to bear on their community institution that they were responsible for administering uh, as superintendents, principals, uh, school board members, and there were also some teachers there. And that was one group. There was another group there that felt that they were the targets that th 
this was not a balancing act. This was not a community institution trying to incorporate a variety of different views and curriculum, but they felt that they were a target. Their institution was really the issue. And when you talked with those folks, there were a couple of interesting things. First was that the group that felt that they were the targets universally were people who had been through a community struggle over these issues. These were educators who had had concerted efforts directed at their schools to try and change curriculum, to try and remove a book, to try and deny a teacher tenure, fill in the blank, whatever the issue was, but they had experienced that pressure. They tended to feel much more strongly that public education, their institution was the target. The educators who really hadn't experienced it or had experienced it a little bit were still trying to strive for some kind of balance between what they perceived as competing interests. But what was interesting in the discussion you had with that group, or at least the discussions I had with that group, was that they were very unclear about what the competing interests were. I talked with a school board member from rural Oklahoma about the pressure that she felt being on the school board and this feeling she had of being in the middle. And I said, well, have you had these quote-unquote Christian right groups attacking curricular issues and things? And she said, well, we've seen some of that, but not an awful lot. But yes, we've seen that. And I said, well, can you explain to me what the balance on the other side of the spectrum is? If you've got the extreme right here and the extreme left over here, what's the pressure you've seen from the extreme left? And she said, well, it's those homosexuals. And I asked her, I said, well, when was the last time, knowing she was from rural Oklahoma, I was feeling the same way. When was the last time that you had radical homosexuals testifying in a school board meeting about textbook adoption or about a curricular issue? And she said, that's, we haven't. Obviously, we haven't. But we know that that's happening and that's out there. And I asked several people if they had seen homosexual interest groups coming to school board meetings requesting specific changes in curriculum. And they hadn't seen them. And so I became a little bit confused about what the pressure from the left is. And the people that I talked to couldn't articulate it very well. There was certainly discussion about feminist groups objecting to sexist language in text. There was discussion about radical leftist groups like the NAACP objecting to racist content in textbooks and in curriculum. But there wasn't, nobody there had had a personal experience with that. And there was, with all of the people that I talked with, a general consensus that clearly the most organized, the most active at this time in history are these pressures from the right. And so it's the whole issue of where schools are in regard to these kinds of pressures. Very often there is a desire on the part of school administrators, schools as institutions to really want to be in the middle ground. Because that's really, most community institutions do have to be in the middle ground and play some balancing. And do some balancing between competing interests in the community. So it is a, it's a common perception out there, but it's wrong. And that's what I think is important to 
traffic chapter here in Great Falls. There are people within the Citizens for Excellence in Education information loop back into Billings, Columbia Falls. We see them all over the state, but they're one of the larger national groups headed up by Bob Simons. This is a quote. We need strong school board members who know right from wrong. The Bible being the only true source on right and wrong should be the guide for board members. Only godly Christians can truly qualify for this critically important position. Next quote, Reverend Jerry Falwell. I don't think I need to talk about spirit and explain who he is. I hope to live to see the day when, as in the early days of our country, we don't have any public schools. The churches will have taken them over again and Christians will be running them. Third quote. Now this is a fellow named Joe Martin who we ran into his literature up in Columbia Falls. He's out of Dallas, Texas. And this gets to the point I was talking about is faith being a palpable presence in society right now. The days are dark and dangerous. The public schools are no longer the servants of the public, but the tool of a higher authority who we know ultimately to be Satan. And so you begin to see, and you see this all over within the movement, and you can talk about, well, that's not really saying we don't have public schools. That's saying that we have Christian public schools. I mean, there's a point where it gets hard to say what's public education and what's not. But it's very clear that the leadership in the Christian right wants to see a fundamental change in who is controlling what's going on in the public schools. And many of them absolutely talk about elimination of public schools, going to a voucher system, private Christian academies. I think all of us are familiar with the school choice issue to some degree, but that's about moving money out of the public system and into the private system to fund those schools. So there are a couple of issues, I think, that flow from that. Why do we see this emphasis on education? Why are we seeing these organizations of all the community institutions that they can pick? Why schools? And there are a number of reasons. Some of them are pretty obvious. And the first one is, and I think we all need to remember this as we're watching these kinds of fights go on, is one is a genuine concern. In conferences like this, I think there's a tendency, because we're doing all of this analysis about what's going on here, to make it sound like the people involved in this don't really believe what they say. They're kind of pulling strings and manipulating things. And that's not, I don't think, generally true. I think it's important right off the mark to recognize that the people who are involved in this movement have genuine concerns about what's going on in publication. They feel that that is a critically important issue, and they are concerned about self-esteem programs. They are concerned about sex education programs. They are concerned about crime in schools, weapons in schools. And these are legitimate issues to be concerned about. And so we should never get into the trap of discounting how important those issues are. So right off the bat, I think it's important to recognize that there are some legitimate issues, and the people that you're dealing with really believe that there's a better way to do things. So first of all, they're involved in the educational arena because there really are issues they're concerned about, and there really are some issues that we all ought to be concerned about. The second thing, and now I'll start to talk about the cynical kinds of things. The second thing is there is a tremendous amount of money on the table here. That if people who advocate private religious education can be successful at moving the amount of money that we spend on quote-unquote public education into these different institutions, we're not talking about nickel and dime. There is a tremendous amount of money at stake on the table here. And these organizations, 
to activate and motivate a core of people at this ultimate local level. And that is the stated goal of the Christian Coalition, is to get down to the local level. We're trying to move out of this nationally centralized control model and much more into local activism. And working on school elections and school politics is probably the ultimate place to do that. The other place that they very clearly have targeted is local Republican Party Central Committee and precinct positions. Again, for a whole host of reasons, some of those are very legitimate policy issues. Some of them are organizational kinds of issues. But again, local party politics, local party offices are the ultimate in local politics. And if your strategy is to build a grassroots movement, it's a very good place to begin to understand how to activate people, get them involved, get them into your information loop, and move them up into other offices. So those are some of the motivations why we're seeing things, people becoming more involved in this particular movement, becoming more and more involved in local schools. So the question then becomes, where do we see this? I mean, what is really prompting these organizations to get involved in local schools? And what are the kind of hot flash issues? And I'm going to hit on this real briefly. But the thing to understand is that the flash can come over anything. It can be one chapter in a reading book. Or an illusion, for example, one school in Montana has dealt with very significant problems because of a reading series that had a ghost as one of the characters. I think it was a third grade reading series. And it's not the kind of thing that you would expect the challenge to come over out of the whole host of things going on in the school and what you could choose. It just wasn't what I would have thought the conflict would start over. We've seen conflicts start over computer training programs. So it's important to recognize that the flash point can be really anything. And you may not be able to predict that. But there are some that are pretty obvious ones. Self-esteem programs. We've seen real problems with, in Montana, PUMSA do so, elementary counseling kinds of programs. And why is that, do you think? They believe, and what they say is that it's undermining the role of the family because the people should get their, their self-esteem should come from the family and from the Bible. And this gets into the whole issue of values and imparting of values. There's some real differences of opinion about if public schools begin to get into things like values clarification, all kinds of issues surrounding adoption of values, that values are given to us and we don't need to discuss values. Which, and again, I'm not an educator by training, but what's interesting to me is most educators believe that one of the critical roles of education is to impart values, the values of our society. And I think that's really true. I think if you try and imagine, if you try and imagine an education system without values being imparted, what do you have left? I mean, there's just nothing there. But, so that's, that's a, that's a tension point. So those kinds of self-esteem and counseling programs, they feel, are undermining the role of the family. Incidentally, school lunch programs and breakfast programs have come under attack because they, they are undermining what the family should be doing. The mom should be home cooking. Yeah. So, yeah. whether it be 
may be there because of the dragon may be there because of the value clarification may be there because they don't understand what the program is and they've read this thing from CEE that says it's satanic um, and your best shot to head that off is in your first first meeting um, because if, if it gets confrontational and people are used outside the, the communication gets tough and, and I'll talk about that in the, the uh, tactics that they use but um, obviously AIDS uh, AIDS education uh, sex education drug education program falls under um, under very um, very heavy attack but understand that there have also been attacks on that program and the things that you just wouldn't think um, wouldn't think are going to cause these problems um, and that's why it's important to talk with people about what um, what really is at the basis of their concern um, before you end up in the school board meeting with 500 people um, shaking their CEE literature at you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the tactics uh, that many of these groups use. Um, and first of all, to give you some, some generalizations about those tactics, we are talking about political pressure tactics. Um, generally, that's, that's what's going on here. Through uh, pressure, they want to bring about a change. Um, that change, and th there's another distinction I should make here. Um, the Human Rights Network is an organization uh, is not <coughs> concerned at all about a parent who comes to a school administrator and says, for religious reasons, philosophical reasons, political reasons, whatever, I object to this material. Therefore, I want you to come up with an alternative for my student. And I think that schools for my child. And I think the schools have an obligation to do that um, to the extent that it's feasible, and I think the courts have said that. It's a far, far different thing when a group of parents or a parent comes into a school and says, I object to this material because of my religious beliefs, my political beliefs, and therefore I want nobody in the school or in the community exposed to it. So we should be real clear about the difference here. That, that as an organization, we have no concern about individual uh, rights and uh, individuals who are offended by certain material requesting that their children um, not be exposed to that, or you know, for that matter, if they want to remove their children from, this, from the school because there's, there's material there that, that uh, they object to, that's fine. But that's very different than coming in and saying, we want to change the curriculum that everybody in the community is exposed to. Okay, so keeping that in mind as, as the position of our organization. Um, the tactics being used here are, are typical tactics that you would see from any group uh, seeking to move, uh, any extremist group seeking to move a political agenda. The first thing to realize is that they rely on intimidation. Intimidation is a very big part of this. Uh, the, the tax school board meeting with 500 people demanding immediate action on a curriculum issue being very loud and very confrontational is an intimidation tactic. 500 people is a lot of people. But the school district may have 15,000 registered voters. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're seeing any representation of the community at large, but it is still a very intimidating thing for decision makers to have 500 angry people in a room uh, screaming. And so most of these tactics I'm going to talk about rely on that. Um, that intimidation factor. The other thing is most of these tactics can be executed by a, a very small group of people. That just doesn't take a large number of people to put together this program. Uh, a telephone tree can be executed by a pretty small number of people. And um, I work for public officials and have for a long time. And it's amazing that a school board member gets 10 phone calls at home in two nights, and you talk to them two days later, and those 10 phone calls have all of a sudden turned into, in their mind, this ground.
pull these things off. And most of them are designed to make it appear that there's a, a big groundswell of, of support. The other thing is that um, they, many of these organizations are using fear um, to motivate their support. Uh, and that it is fear that you're seeing in the telephone calls, it's fear that you're seeing at the meetings that uh, the AIDS education program is promoting homosexuality. Um, that what fill in the blank, as the, there can be many different ways this is done, but, but at the bottom of it is your child's future is at stake here, and if you don't get involved in this, your child is going to be ruined, your family is going to be ruined, our community is going to be ruined, and it is an immediate thing that you need to do. But invariably, we're talking about a, a substantial element of fear to motivate people. Educators don't help that at all when they come out from, from the school to say, well, what we're doing is OBE and we're going to do standardized testing and age normalized, da 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 da, and, it, and the community kind of goes, what do you think what they're saying? This is back to the school they go. Um, and then in comes the guy from CEE who says, well, you see what they just did to you. Um, so it, it is fear based on a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge of what's going on in the school. And those things are under, underlying most of these tactics. Um, again, I think it's important to understand that when you're talking with the person across the table about these issues, that they may not be ascribing to this full agenda. And, I, and I'm going to keep on saying that because I think it's a real critical point. Um, <coughs> The first thing that's often going on when you see a community meeting with uh, 400 people showing up, there's been a very targeted effort to motivate people going to specific churches in the community. Um, that prior to that meeting, there have been bulletins going out. Um, people have been contacting pastors and saying, we've got to do something about this. That, that they begin commonly working through specific churches in the community and talking about these issues and, and tapping into a whole host of informational sources um, from a particular perspective. And th there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's really kind of what our democratic process is about. It's, there, it's not that there's anything inherently evil about this, but it's important to recognize that by the time the big meeting comes up, there's been some work and very often it targets through uh, fundamental and evangelical churches in the community depending on, on how receptive, primarily the pastors are to this. I mean, the, uh, all fundamentalist churches are not into the same agenda, um, or the congregations being into it, but that's happened in a number of ways. The congregation has said, you know, we're, we don't think that this is that bad. We like our local school. We think they're doing a good job. But it's important to recognize that's an organizational channel that they're using. Um, the other, and this feeds into the fear thing, is don't bother with the facts. What we've seen time and time again is a, a concerted effort to muddy up the waters and deny the facts as they're presented. Um, and this, we, we also see this incidentally in the racist movement. There, there's an information loop here that when people drop into it, they're, they're into that informational loop, and it becomes very difficult to present them with any other information that doesn't fit, fit into what they're getting from Citizens for Excellence in Education or, or whatever these other organizations may be. Um, and, and when presented with facts, they are deemed to be part of the conspiracy. The, a lot of um, the, the fear that is generated in this movement is based on the concept that there are conspiracies out there. Uh, the Saints is behind this, or um, you know, the, the NEA is behind this. But what happens when people buy these conspiracies is it enables them to, uh, to deny any facts that they're given because that fact becomes part of the conspiracy. Um, and so it's a very powerful conspiracy theory again. This, this isn't just in the area of education and the Christian right. This is uh, all over the place. But once people start buying into conspiracy theories, it's very easy to deny any facts that they're given because that's part of the conspiracy, and that happens here. Um, and the activists within this movement are very good at playing this. A good example is up in Columbia Falls where they've been having quite a bit of uh, controversy over outcome-based education. Um, the, this Joe Martin 
secret testing of your children. And people looked around and said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They said, see, it's a secret. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you respond to that? Um, that it's really pretty masterful if you think about it. Uh, and as far as I know, OBI isn't doing any secret testing. But um, yeah. Yeah, I've worked there. <laughs> so I think it should be all fired up. Um, the other thing is vocal control rather than local control. And this is the tax meeting um, where all of a sudden Fairfield School Board, which has been operating, you know, with two or three people coming to board meetings and the board kind of gets their business done, then lo and behold, all of a sudden one night in come 50 people. And the school board is kind of like, oh my God. And not only are the 50 people there, they're mad, they're demanding, and they want something to happen right now, right now. Um, often these meetings are characterized by shouting, shouting down anybody who disagrees with them. They're also characterized by only one point of view being present because the rest of the community really doesn't know this is all going on. The, the rest of the community who hasn't been in that same information loop where people are getting very whipped up doesn't know this is going on and then all of a sudden here before school board, and you know, school board members in Montana are making a heck of a sacrifice. I, they're they're giving their own time, um, and, and they're often uh, getting griped at about this, that, or the other thing. It's a pretty thankless job. And now, all of a sudden, on top of it being thankless and having to deal with individual complaints, here's this 50 people who are very angry, and we want this to happen right now, and by God, you better vote on it. Uh, very intense pressure to move immediately with a very large number of people. Now, if you take that school district and remember how many total people live in the community, this is a very, very small group. But it's hard to keep that perspective when you're kind of back up against the wall with people pointing and yelling at you. And it's, it's a topic, um, or it's a tactic that we see very commonly used. Um, the demand for immediate action always accompanies that. Do this right away or we'll sue you. Do this right away or we'll unelect you. Do this right away. But it's do it right away. Do it now. Um, and that's important because if it's not done right away, it can change. The, the environment, all of the work of getting 50 people there um, could all go out the window. But it's a demand for immediate action and it's part of the intimidation tactic. Um, now, for, for those who think, well, all they're talking about is the Dragon and Pumpkin program. And <laughs> is it up? Will we get rid of the Dragon and Pumpkin program? Big deal. Um, understand that that doesn't make it go away. That then it's on to the next issue. And often it'll be on to the next issue within the same meeting. So it just becomes this, this series of, of kind of demands um, that coupled with all of this pressure from all of the people being there. Um, the other thing is petitions, the, the graded petitions. Um, one school in Montana, uh, local elementary counselor was up for tenure and there had been this fight going on in the community and as she came up for tenure uh, the, the uh, Christian Wright folks in the community who were upset about the counseling program started a community petition to deny her tenure. Um, luckily at that time there was another group that had, all, had formed in the community because they got concerned about what was going on and they did their own petition. But the petition uh, is another tactic, and it often combines with the tax meeting, where they present this petition with all of this support to show the community uh, community support for whatever it is they're proposing. And so petitions are another um, very common intimidation tactic. We're seeing more and more threatened lawsuits. If you don't do this, we will sue you. Or uh, discussion of pretty legalistic things like uh, this is a violation of the Hatch Act. Um, citing specific statutes saying, you must do these things or we will do this to you. Um, so we're seeing, and I, this is a trend I expect is going to pick up and is coupled with what I was talking about, more and more emphasis on the, the judiciary as a forum where they, they can attain some of their goals. Um, the threatened lawsuit, and actual lawsuits. Um, there are at least two organizations within the Christian right that will provide uh, attorneys to people who want to pursue uh, technical challenges and things like that. And it, it varies. Um, it, and it's changing. They have, it depends on the nature
nature of, of the challenge, and it depends on what, what they're challenging. Um, the kind of, I think the weirdest one that, um, that I'm aware of is a case, and I think it was in Alabama, where the parents were essentially arguing that the curriculum, overall curriculum really in the school, was um, secular humanism, secular humanism, humanism is a religion, and therefore this is a violation of the Establishment Clause. Um, the state shall not adopt it, or any religion. Um, and they won that at the district court level. But, but the appeals court kicked it back. I think it depends on what the, what the topic is and what the confrontation is about. And, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. And that's, that's why I say talk to people and find out really what their objections are so you know if there's some legal problem. Absolutely crippling for districts. Absolutely. The other thing that goes along with lawsuits, and it may come before then, it certainly comes if you get a lawsuit, um, is repeated demands for extensive information. We want to see all of your documents for the last five years and all of your travel to the superintendent because we want to see if you went to a human rights conference at a public expense. Um, and therefore, we want to see all of these things. We want to see teacher evaluations. We want to see this, that, and the other thing. Um, when, when there is a heated battle going on over these, these kinds of topics, um, there'll be tremendous requests for information, and the school administration will spend a lot of time putting together information to answer these questions. And it's a real tough balancing act, and you're not going to get me to say that they shouldn't be able to get this information. Um, the question becomes, to what extent do they really want this information because they need it to try and figure out what's going on in their school, and to what extent are they using that um, as a tactic to, um, to kind of wash over this local institution. Um, within the hate movement, and we do, most of our work is involved in the white supremacy movement, um, the Christian right, which is very <coughs> big. Um, is something we've gotten into in the last year, but within the hate movement, there's a group we, we generically call constitutionalists. Um, and they're masters of trying to bog up uh, local government by filing all kinds of documents. Um, and so we're fairly familiar with, uh, as a tactic to cause disruption, um, putting all kinds of weird filings and things in the local government. When that happens with the Christian right fight in the school, um, to what extent is it their legitimate desire to know how their money's being spent and to know what their elected officials are doing or what the staff in the school is doing versus how much of that's a conscious tactic just to kind of wash over the, the, the small institution um, is anybody's guess. And I think it's been very much a kind of dispute we've got going. Um, the other very disturbing tactic that we've seen is personal attacks. Um, and the, again, Fairfield provides a good example of this. The, the, a teacher involved in one of these was getting uh, anonymous um, messages left on her answering machine about being a witch, uh, threats to boycott her husband's business. Uh, the superintendent got some fairly nasty stuff um, suggesting finding employment elsewhere. Um, and what's important to understand about those attacks, aside from the fact that they kind of uh, offend all of our sensibilities, is they have a tremendous effect on the people get, that are, are receiving this stuff. And by and large, people will shrug it off. And, and when you're talking to them, they'll say, oh, well, you know, no big deal. It's just a, a few people in the community. And, um, they'll shrug it off if they say anything about it at all. The thing to understand about that is when someone is shrugging off that kind of stuff, um, it's just not that easy. When you're under that kind of pressure and you've got people saying um, that you are a witch or that you're satanic or that you're evil, um, it, people need support in that environment. Um, and, and this is something, I'm not sure that, that it's tactical that they do, but it's something that certainly occurs regularly within these disputes, is personalizing what's going on. Um, and personalizing people who oppose their point of view, um, the tendency to 
getting the personal attacks is certainly something that we've seen a lot of. The other thing that is a, a tactical issue that's very hard to deal with is uh, the adopt innoc innocuous sounding titles like uh, civil distress organization. Who's, who could oppose that? Um, uh, so you, you'll see community improvement kinds of names and uh, it becomes hard to really pin down what what you're seeing in the community. Um, so, and that's something that we've seen a lot of. And then the final thing is refusing to acknowledge any organizational ties. Um, and and I've asked people as they were handing out CEE con Citizens for Excellence and Education, as they were handing out the literature, are you affiliated in any way with CEE? And they don't even know who they are. Never even heard of them. Um, and that is clearly tactical. Christian Coalition of Montana um, during the last legislature testifying against uh, decriminalization of um, same-sex contact in Montana. Um, Lori Kukin would get up, she's the director of the Christian Coalition of Montana. She would get up and testify, and I'm here on behalf of my family. Well, I'm sure she is there on behalf of her family, but come on, you know. Um, and so that's, that's a conscious tactic. They really don't want to be associated with these other groups because they can be discredited pretty easily. I mean, if, if you can show that, hey, your strings are being pulled out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, uh, that makes it a much less local thing. So um, are there any questions about, about that? Seen, that I'm aware of, I haven't seen amendments done to law of that. Who's the one here? Is it the Christian Legal Organization? Yeah, the, the Brotherford Institute is doing that. <coughs> and I think that's going to be the answer. Justice and Justice League. Right. I don't know. That, see, this is the other tactical thing across the Christian realm is uh, it's very shifting sands um, about who the organizations are and they, they reconstitute themselves. Part of that's tactical, part of that is any group if that happens. Um, and that's why what we say is, you know, if, to the extent you can find the organizational ties, that's great, but it's the ideas that are the problem. Yeah? I'm not on the school board or a school administration um, gives some advance uh, warning that the 400 or 500 people have been alerted to their churches and are coming into the next board meeting. Talk to the community, I mean, actively actively get out and talk in the community about what's going on in the school. Um, the, to the extent, the more isolated the school gets in the community, the more capable um, those organizations are of doing that kind of thing. Um, the best thing a school can do is proactively be out there talking about what's really going on in the school. And outcome-based education is a very good example. Um, th there is People are very concerned about outcome-based education, I, and I don't understand it that well, but there's not, they have a perception that all of the schools are adopting this uh, approach, and it is really not the case. Um, and if the school was, it's a local school issue. Um, but if, if your school is now talking about uh, issues changing curriculum and things, if your school as an institution isn't out there saying this is what we're doing, it gets very easy to say, this is what they're really up to over here. Um, so the best thing to do is to reach out, out front. So. Yeah? Uh, I came late, of course. I was wondering, are you targeting smaller rural schools, or are they hitting them all, all sizes? All, all sizes, um, all over. And it really is, the pattern is more where they can organize, where, where 
the problem because there there are two realities i think that we really need to face what is a self candidate can only win once if your assumption is if your assumption is that they've got terribly unpopular ideas um that don't enjoy any measure of community support then they're only going to win once and and hopefully out, out the end of it in fact i think you could make the argument the best thing that could happen to a local school is to get some self candidates on get the whole community win <coughs>
courtesy. Uh, you know, these sound very basic, but they get hard to implement when you're, you're talking about people um, that you disagree with very strongly. Um, knowing the process is very important. Who makes the decisions? When is the decision going to get made? What's the criteria the decision is going to be made on? Um, understanding the process and where your opportunities are to present your point of view uh, is very important. And you certainly don't want to screw up in those areas and alienate the decision makers. Because as decision makers, as I just said, we spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what's the process we've got to establish here? But you want to make sure you understand that process. Um, make your position very public. And that we'll, we'll relate this to the Human Rights Conference. Um, we uh, have been seeing a lot of letters from the editors about this conference. We have been seeing very few letters to the editor proportionally in support of this conference. And I found myself <coughs> busily writing a letter to the editor about this conference, trying to figure out how to make it sound not like it was self-serving because I'm the president of the organization. I found myself saying, we know the silent majority supports us. And, and then Richard Nixon popped into the back of my <laughs> I can't believe that's where I am. It is important for all of us to get off our rears and get public about what we think because the other side is doing that and doing it very effectively. Yeah. Um, since part of this discussion, I guess, is just focused on education matters, would you allow me just to make sure. a couple of comments? Certainly. Sure. I am a school administrator. But before that, I spent a few years teaching uh, in several colleges, universities, particularly. So I'm a little older than some folks, I guess. But don't make me an expert, certainly. But I have been around the block a couple of times. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say I don't speak for my school board. And neither do I speak for my community. Only for myself. As an individual, number one, and secondly, as a school superintendent, and I have never had any kind of so-called attack from the far right. I'm straight. I'm married. You know, kids, typical family, I guess. I'm somewhere on the right, I suppose. I hope I'm not an extremist. I, like many of you, uh, do not accept extreme views. I agree with you totally about respect that kind of thing. It's extremely important. I totally uh, am opposed to violence of any kind, or opposed to abuse and all that. Well, having said that, uh, I think that it's important to understand that, uh, or at least in my view, 
perspective which i believe is a legitimate perspective for people to have a legitimate perspective for them to bring to the political arena and to bring to the school or combined with a real attempt to dominate the discussion um by these kinds of predator tactics uh and unfortunately i think the thing that makes it and the thing that bothers me more than anything else about the success of it in the school arena is it's very dependent on uh much of the community not being involved um in local and in and out in school elections and things but your point i and i think that's what one of the things i'm trying to emphasize is don't assume that uh people on a specific position buy a whole agenda um and i think that's critical to understanding how to deal with uh with pressure the problem is that it this is not like accidental that a lot of the pressure we're seeing is very orchestrated and and when you read the cee's training manual on how to affect policy in the school there is no comparable organization anywhere else doing that kind of um structured programmatic this is how we're going to do this and you combine that not only with cee but some other uh quote unquote religious right organizations and the closest thing that i've ever seen on on the flip side is pta who i would not characterize as leftist by any stretch um i don't know there may be uh left organizations out there with schools on their agenda um i haven't seen it in my head at all um that doesn't mean it hasn't happened somewhere um so the reality that the concern that i have and the reality that i see is that schools clearly are being targeted by people like bob simon who who clearly believe that the only people qualified to work in schools are christian that's a scary concept to me um that is a conscious concerted effort that we are seeing manifested uh from billings uh to white place um and we've seen elements of that all over the state i i think you're lucky if you haven't had one of these disputes so yeah well this is a little take on that comment which is um actually i think tolerance is a fundamental value that a lot of our whole i am an educator and um what troubles me is you never taught but what troubles me as i thought i heard you not advocating tolerance now maybe i was wrong but not wanting to hire a blank fill in the blank and as an educator i would say tolerance is a fundamental it's not a left concept it's a concept that we're as a country built around understanding that we come from many places we're building a pluralistic attempt at what we are um and i think that's where i don't know if you agree or disagree with this but that's where i am somewhat troubled by this discussion sometimes saying there's a you know pressures of right or left i feel that the school itself in many ways has a value system to affirm which is this tolerance and the building of of people who can participate in a pluralistic society so i will say that that would be my question back to you which is that's not a left concept that's that's a concept about what we try to do to um raise people for education
and I think the, the basic assumption and where, where the real conflict lies over this whole issue of homosexuality, um, not only speaking, but speaking is certainly a very hot platform for it, is, is the differing views of what homosexuality is and what homosexuals want, um, and there's this perception that they're somehow a threat to children. Um, but now we're moving down into the basic paradigm thing that I was starting my talk about. Is we argue that down to a certain point of view, your positions are in faith, my position is my position, we can disclose all the facts, um, and, and I can assure you that there is no documentation that supports the homosexuals are a threat to the children, and I'm sure that you would assure me that they are. Um, and that becomes a political issue. But that's when you go to the community and you say to your people, we've got to do something about this. When I go to the community and I say to my people, we've got
to defend 